This video is brought to you by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming membership service founded by filmmakers, bringing you premium content, diving deep into the history subjects that you want to learn more about. Magellan TV has the richest and most varied content on history available anywhere. Magellan TV has over 2,000 documentary movies, series, and exclusive playlists. They have ancient, modern, current, early modern, war, and biographical history, which can be watched anywhere on your television, laptop, or mobile device. We highly recommend Heroes of the Forgotten War, the Battle of Kapyong. In this documentary, you will witness the story of how a small force of outnumbered Australians, Canadians, and New Zealanders stopped a force of Chinese soldiers from invading Seoul in 1951 during the Korean War. Brought to life by reenactments, this documentary portrays what military academies have described as the perfect defensive battle. All the shows are without interruption from commercials and many programs are available in 4K. Simple history viewers get a one-month free membership trial. Just go to try.magellantv.com slash simple history or click the link in the description below. Head over there now. The Siege of Chattoville, September 13th through the 17th. 1961. The Siege of Jadoville from September 13th to the 17th, 1961 was a forgotten military action of the Irish UN peacekeeping forces during the Congo Crisis. It's the story of 155 soldiers of the A Company, 35th Battalion of the Irish Army, who fought against an enemy that outnumbered them for five days while kept under siege in the hostile region. Because they surrendered only when they were left without water, food, and ammunition, the document of their heroism was kept under the carpet for more than 50 years. The Congo Crisis began in 1960, the same year when the country declared independence after almost a century-long Belgian rule. After only a few months, the central government lost control over the country as Katanga, led by Prime Minister Moise Toshombi, declared its independence, later followed by Kasai, Oriental Province, and Leopoldville. Katanga was of greater importance to the future of the Congo, as it was the wealthiest portion of the country due to its huge mining resources. Without the capacity to deal with secessionists and the Belgian army that still had not left the country, the government of the Republic of the Congo, led by President Kasavubu and Prime Minister Lumumba, called the United Nations for help. In July 1960, the United Nations Operation in the Congo, or ONUC, was formed. UN peacekeeping forces from Africa, Asia, and Europe were deployed across the entire country with a task to monitor the withdrawal of Belgian troops and protect the civilian population. The Irish contingent, along with the Swedish and Indian soldiers, were sent to the disputed region of Katanga. The UN headquarters was established at the province's capital, Elizabethville. HQ deployed a detached unit to the 80-mile-away distant town of Jadoville with the task of protecting the local Belgian population. Jadoville was a town of great strategic importance because of the nearby Shinkolobwe mine. It was a mine with the largest uranium deposits in the world. And it was this mine that provided the uranium needed to make the Hiroshima and Nagasaki A-bombs. Even though the UN forces were responsible for protecting the local population, it was obvious they were not welcome. Neither natives nor Belgians who supported Katanga secessionists looked with favor on the UN base in the town. The commander of A Company, 35th Battalion of the Irish Army stationed in Jadoville, Commandant Pat Quinlan, was very well aware of the situation. As a measure of precaution, he ordered his men to build a defensive perimeter around the entire base. They were told to dig deep trenches, stockpile water, and carry their guns at all times. The following days would show how good this preparation was. On September 13, 1961, ONUC launched an offensive named Operation Morthor against the forces of the state of Katanga. This action meant that the UN directly sided with the central Congo government. The Katangese response was immediate, as if they knew about the UN offensive before it happened. What was to be a quick offensive lasting two hours to resolve the secession once and for all, in fact lasted from September 13th to the 21st, and was the moment in which a peacekeeping mission turned into a war between the UN and the Katanga. On the same day at 7.40 a.m., while almost all Irish soldiers were attending mass, Katanga Gendarmerie attacked the Jadoville base. Luckily for the Irish soldiers, they were noticed by Private Billy Reddy, who was on guard duty that morning. Private Reddy fired a warning shot and alerted the whole unit. 
as the Irish soldiers in the base were ordered to always carry their weapons, they manned their positions instantly. The Katangan gendarmeries attacked the UN base with a force between 3,000 and 4,000 men. The majority of them were inexperienced soldiers from the local Luba tribe, but there were also a lot of Belgian settlers and battle-hardened mercenaries from France, Belgium, and Rhodesia. They were armed with a wide spectrum of various light weapons and supported with 81mm mortars and French 75mm MLE 1897 field guns. They even had air support from a modified Fuga Magister training jet. The jet had machine guns added as well as underwing bombs, which proved crucial in the assault on the Irish peacekeepers. Katangi's forces were financed by the Anglo-Belgian mining cartel Union Minaire de Haute Katanga a covert international company that was responsible for supplying most of the world's copper, cobalt, and uranium. The base was defended by almost 160 Irish soldiers armed only with light weapons. The majority of soldiers were armed with FN-FAL self-loading rifles and British Lee Enfield No. 4 rifles. They were also armed with a few Bren light machine guns, Swedish Carl Gustav light machine guns, and Vickers machine guns. The support platoon was armed with 60mm mortars, the Irish, however, had the advantage of the supreme commanding ability of Major Quinlan. The way he led his men through five days of the siege was nothing less than ingenious. When the assault began, the Irish soldiers' alertness and defensive perimeter enabled them to repel the first attacking wave with ease. The first attack was followed by a few hours of silence, after which a new wave followed along with bombardment with mortars and field guns. Once again, the well-entrenched Irishmen managed to withstand the attack with only a few soldiers wounded. What Major Quinlan realized on the first day was that his perimeter was too wide. Under the cover of night, he withdrew his men inwards to a new position where they dug new trenches. The new position allowed the Irish to hold a better defense, especially because it was elevated and allowed them a complete overview of their surroundings. The following morning started with a new barrage, but on the previously abandoned trenches. That same day, the attackers called in the air support. When the enemy Fuga Magister flew over the base, the Irish soldiers thought it was a UN plane. Moments later, the jets started bombing the Irish positions, destroying their vehicles and preventing them from making a retreat. Attack after attack in waves followed. Even though the Katangi gendarmes managed to get closer to the perimeter, the Irish managed to repel every single attack inflicting heavy casualties on their enemy. The Irish mortars also managed to silence the Katangan artillery as their strength severely diminished, the Katangans asked for a ceasefire. Major Quinlan agreed, as he too wanted to buy some time and allow UN reinforcements to arrive. The headquarters at Elizabethville sent a reinforcement of 500 Irish, Swedish, and Indian Gurkha soldiers to relieve soldiers at Jadoville. But these were fought off on their way to Jadoville by mercenaries in Katangi's service. The besieged soldiers did receive help and water supplies. A helicopter carrying water landed into the base under intense fire. However, the water was undrinkable because it was stored in petrol containers. As time passed, the situation for the Irish soldiers worsened. The Katangi's forces broke the ceasefire and continued their attacks. The Irish soldiers were slowly coming to the end of their ammunition and even worse, food and water. Since Major Quinlan had not been receiving messages from his HQ about reinforcements or orders on what to do next, he decided to surrender. But before the surrender, his men had killed 50 mercenaries, more than 300 Katangi gendarmes, and wounded 1,000 more. Irish casualties were totaled at only five wounded soldiers. After five days of combat, they simply had no more capacity to continue the fight. On September 17th, Major Quinlan made an agreement with the Katangans to cease fire in Jadoville. The agreement, however, ended with the disarmament of Irish soldiers, who were then sent to captivity. During the first three and a half weeks of captivity, the Irish soldiers were treated well. The Katangans did not want any bad publicity. Their intention was to exchange the prisoners for a UN promise of a ceasefire. When the gendarmerie took over supervision of the Irish POWs, their treatment worsened significantly but the captured Irish were eventually exchanged for Katangi soldiers held by the United Nations. Upon release, the soldiers of the A Company 35th Irish Battalion returned to Elizabethville, where they stayed until the end of their rotation. In December 1961, they returned home to Ireland after being relieved by the 36th Irish Battalion. Instead of being welcomed with laurels, soldiers from Jadoville were met with condemnation. 
Despite the fact that A Company managed to fight off the much more powerful enemy, Army officials disfavored the fact that Major Quinlan eventually laid down his arms. The fact that the unit was left without ammunition, food, and water, and that the command structure was the one that failed, was ignored. Only after more than 40 years, men of A Company of the 35th Battalion were given credit for their bravery during the Siege of Jadoville. Major Quinlan was posthumously relieved of all allegations of soldierly misconduct. In November 2005, a monument was unveiled to the brave soldiers of A Company of the 35th Battalion in Kustum Barracks, Athlone.